<clears throat> well, hello everybody. Um, first of all, let me thank Oxford Union for such a distinguished opportunity. Uh, I've seen all of the people who's been here before me. I was very impressed that Elton John, instead of singing, was talking. So I wonder if I could sing, but my voice is a bit coarse. Um, so let me first introduce myself. Um, I'm a former, what has been 26 years, um, officer of Soviet foreign intelligence, which is public knowledge. And um, I've been since 92 a banker. I still am, but uh, I've got the most reliable bank in the country, but with no business, because a few years ago, the bank came under attack as a payback for my investigations regarding the Russian fraudulent bankers, of which a few hundred are living comfortably in, 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 in London. <coughs> I was a member of parliament for four years. Um, I ran a few times for mayor's positions in Moscow and in Sochi. I was heavily reprimanded for that. Uh, and the topic I'm going to be speaking about is um, global kleptocracy, which has been a topic of my investigations because I'm also deputy head of Nova Gazeta, which is the only investigative free newspaper back in Moscow. You probably heard about Anna Politkovska killed in 2006, but we've lost six journalists in the line of duty. And um, I'll be speaking in my capacity as a journalist, because I just realized yesterday I've been doing that for 20 years, because in 98, uh, one of the world economic financial crises, I've noticed that about 20 major banks declared themselves bankrupt. And I knew that the bankers have stolen the client's money from say 20% to, to 100%. And ever since, there's been under 2,000 banks which went into bankruptcy in Russia. And not in any case out of those, there's a, a chance that nothing has been stolen. Um, my estimate that these few hundred bankers who reside now in London have stolen from the Russian people, which is legal and physical entities, over 100 billion US dollar. Now the dispute, I've just finished a book last September, it's now being translated into English, called Chase for the Banker, uh, which I've written with one intention of trying to, um, to convince Kremlin to follow the American example, where well, the Americans in the recent 10 years have been going after European banks, and they've recovered by just Department of Justice and Ministry of Finance attacking the banks over 300 billion US dollar. And none of those banks has been either attacked because of tax avoidance or sanctions violations or subprime debt, which is the recent case of Deutsche Bank paying 7 billion last year to the American Treasury. But none of them has been defending themselves. It was out of court settlement. So I was just wondering why the Russian government is not doing the same. Um, but we'll soon find out. And suddenly I've sold the book in 30,000 copies which I never expected. I was writing it with my left back foot. Um, but I made two conclusions in the book. One is that according to very important international NGOs, a trillion US dollar is stolen through fraud all, all around the world per year. I'm talking about white collar crime, where people pocket money of the clients from banks, corporations, state corporations, semi-state, private, and of course, bureaucracy takes, you probably have been reading about the questions to the former Malaysian government recently. And we know all the story of Sanya Abacha in Nigeria. And uh, it's quite some, but probably the lion's share of this trillion US dollar defrauded around the world. It probably just comes from banks and corporations. So it's a clear crime. It's easy as, as if nothing has happened. This trillion then being stolen in most of the countries, not only the third world, but I would call them peripheric. This money goes about 35 to 40% to United States, strange enough, and about 25, 30% to UK, but mostly it sits in offshores, 
which are an origin of certain policies of certain countries in the recent few years. So I'm questioning the system. Why is that all of us have to pay taxes? But only the most, the biggest corporations are not paying taxes because they keep their money offshores. In the United States, all of these Googles, Amazons, Apples, and Starbucks keep 2.5 trillion US dollars in offshores. But what is the point? Why is that the ordinary individual is obliged to pay the taxes where the big corporations are not? So I further took my uh, research and I understood that the amount of dirty money sitting in offshore jurisdictions is probably between 50 and 60 trillion US dollar, which equals to the world GDP. Um, so there are always two sides of the equation. It's all very good when you say blame Russia for corruption and fraud, but probably Russian money moving out of the country of really fraudulent origin is 1.5% of all of the money stolen all around the world. So I was traveling recently in, in Africa and I've discovered some very good things Bill Gates Foundation is doing there. So probably, I don't know, in Malawi or in South Africa or in some Rwanda, they're spending tens of millions of US dollars on hospitals, on education, but I don't think Bill Gates really understands that the stock of Google is to a very serious extent financed by the dirty money sitting in offshores. Because what these people do, I'll give you the figures, I think roughly under 10,000 people are stealing this trillion US dollar every year. 10,000. Now the next beneficiary is sitting on the opposite side of the table. These are lawyers, top lawyers. Linklaters was recently mentioned in one of the reports of House of Commons and they started to apologize. But Linklaters will have to be apologizing forever. Uh, I recently was talking to some British journalists and one of them said, I'll give you the name of a big lawyer in London who sits in Heathrow and waits until the fraudster comes from China, from Zimbabwe, from Colombia, mostly from Russia. And he immediately asks this fraudster, you need political asylum. And of course, every fraudster who is stealing under the present political system of Russia immediately turns here to be the victim of the regime. So the lawyer gives him uh, a stick with a, with a slogan on it and asks him to go to the Russian embassy to, to ask for the Kremlin down with Kremlin. This is <laughs> the most bizarre thing I've ever heard because there are people with clean money, Russians, in, in, in this country who are mistreated recently, but the fraudsters are sort of are somehow um, um, acquitted of all of the crimes they've committed back in Russia. Um, I was keeping quiet for a few years because I became completely disillusioned with the Western position. Because you can claim, of course, the political systems of all the countries from which the money is stolen. Uh, but to stop it, you need to just stop admitting this money, laundering them and parking them. Uh, that can be done tomorrow. I mean, in the short, if you ask me whether the British nation wins or loses from that money, I'd rather suggest that it loses. Okay, uh, 200,000 people, lawyers, auditors, bankers, uh, managers of major funds, they are making proceeds from laundering that money. That's clear. But Londoners cannot afford to buy housing because the prices go up. The fundamentals of the British democracy are under a threat. I won't speak here in this audience about it, but we've been in Nova Gazette knowing about certain cases. Well, Guardian reported about President Aliyev, uh, money laundering $2 billion through Scottish offshores and using that money to pay certain politicians and parliamentarians in uh, EC for closing their eyes for him abusing the human rights. That's been a big report. But this is only part of the iceberg, a small one. There's much more threatening things because you cannot sit on tens of trillions of US dollars of dirty money and not be affected. And on top of that, this is a, a ridiculous financial system. Uh, two years I was speaking in Cambridge to 38 
top uh, anti-corruption agencies of the world. And they all came to me, being Russian. And okay, proprietor of British newspapers. They said, you are our last hope. I said, why? Because you only the press can do it. We are fighting the global crime on fraud at national levels, whereby mere phenomena, the, mm, uh, the origin of that, I think, is, is global. Because the money is stolen in Russia, in Zimbabwe, in Colombia, then it goes through Cyprus, through BVI, through Seychelles, through Belize, and then it's parked somewhere. I don't know, in Liechtenstein, because it's a money laundering village. Or in Monaco, which is, I think, the same character. Um, these money laundering villages, these offshores, have to be closed. It's time. It's, I don't know why, but pr probably when capitalism was a bit crazier than it is now, uh, it all been organized. But even the Trump administration don't know how to deal with major American companies keeping the money just offshores. And it's not fair. It's not even paid in dividends to the owners. Um, but I started actually to come back to my normal activities, which I've stopped in 2014 because I was nearly jailed back in Moscow for something I haven't done. And uh, my business was somewhat, I've told you that I've paid back a billion US dollar to clients uh, when the Krishas from law enforcement agencies and central bank came after my bank for my investigations. But life changes. I think the Kremlin's attitude has been becoming much more well disposed to going after the Russian dirty money. You give me a list of major banks and funds, I'll show you how much money is in each of them of the dirty caliber and quality. And I've read the Sunday Times the other week, uh, which said that there's a list of individuals, 130, not mentioning any names, which the National Crime Agency of Britain have identified. Now, I've reasons to believe that is not information yet in public domain, but we will request using the Freedom of Information Act. It looks like that uh, the British government is putting the money where the mouse is. After all of these pronouncements that we will go after the Russian dirty money, they went. Because I've got a couple of names of people who fled UK. Now they're flying back which hasn't been a phenomena for many, many years. Always they've been moving in one direction, from Russia, sometimes from Monaco, to Britain. But if that information is correct, I applaud. Why not confiscate the money? I'm, in fact, trying to push through lawyers an independent, an article. I rarely use uh, these newspapers because it doesn't look nice. I'd rather go to New York Times or Guardian or Telegraph, which I'm doing from time to time on Economist. Um, but the essence of the article is that I've identified five individuals. I give their names. One of them has political asylum. And he was the top official of the Russian state bank, very close to Kremlin. Once he came here with five billion US dollars he has stolen from a bank, he immediately got political asylum and starting picketing the Russian embassy, claiming he's a victim of the regime. But this is completely absurd. Um, the other one is the first deputy head of the Russian state corporation who has stolen one billion US dollar and three more bankers, all of them, for five of them, they've pocketed about 13, 14 billion. If they are questioned, they won't be able to explain the origin of their, of their fortune. Then, why not? And it's interesting, I probably would expect a reaction from, from the Russian government Okay, it's good. I mean, the discussion between the two governments, who's going to confiscate this money? <laughs> okay, there are certain um, ramifications of the British government going against the Russian dirty money because some Arab or some African fraudsters would be wondering, wow, whether it is safe enough in London. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the point that what is, that is what Britain is gaining. Okay. I don't know, a hundred houses being sold. Okay, some property agents would gain. Uh, some lawyers will make some money, but most of that money still would sit offshore, in offshore jurisdictions. And there has to be some, 
some additional room for, for justice in this world. Um, because you will never compensate for that, for charities. The charities in the world raise 500 billion US dollar per year out of that 350 United States. Half of that is being stolen. This is on my radar, but I just don't have enough uh, arms and, and uh, pans to go after this phenomena. But it's another interesting topic. But you will not be able to return this trillion US dollars stolen with, with some charities. Um, so I hope that in the nearest future, at the top level between Britain and the United States, consensus emerging. For example, this G7. We all saw that Trump allegedly offended G7. But there's nothing to offend because G7 is an empty platform. So Putin is probably right when he says, well, if you want Russia back, come to visit us in Moscow because we've never left G8. But I am involved in more serious platforms. It's correct. Why wouldn't G7 pick up this topic of a trillion US dollars stolen from all over the world, London in, in certain countries, who are probably at their national levels are losing rather than gaining anything from it. Uh, and uh, I'll finish at, at a story which we've been investigating for four years. It's a, a story about former Yanukovych government in Ukraine. You probably remember Maidan. And um, it is claimed that the America and European community helped the brave Ukrainian people to kick out the gangsters and corrupt regime of Yanukovych. I have my doubts. I have a, a different view, investigation we haven't finished yet, but we in Nova Gazeta have addressed ourselves to Trump administration. This is not public information. And uh, we state as follows. First of all, the Yanukovych government were stealing a billion US dollars per month, per month for a few years. And the Americans were supplying the cash, the dollar cash. How on earth couldn't Bank of New York have noticed that every month there's a, an extra demand for a billion US dollar in Kiev? That billion US dollar was exchanged for, rup for grievous local currency in Ukraine. Part of them would be stocked in cash, in dollars. Part of them laundered through offshores. And uh, in July 2013, I bumped into an information that the top officials of Yanukovych government have visited a major American investment fund called Franklin Templeton. And they had some discussions. These were our first deputy prime minister, minister of finance and uh, uh, minister of taxes. Three months afterwards, Franklin Templeton announced that it has acquired 50% of foreign debt of Ukraine, which is traded in bonds in Ireland. And this is my doctorate. And I thought, no fund unless they're mad, even with 800 billion under management, this is the biggest and historically the oldest fund in the United States, would risk buying 7 billion US dollar of a foreign country debt unless there is some special arrangement between this government and the fund. And then I took my hypothesis further on, and we've been investigating uh, until recently on Russian and Ukrainian territory. We are 80% sure that what happened is that once they've agreed, Yanukovych dirty money laundered for an offshores reached Franklin Templeton. And Franklin Templeton was using these illegal proceeds to acquire the foreign debt. On top of that, Yanukovych instructed his Minister of Finance to make a few statements that the Ukraine is going to default. So the price of the bonds went down. So just imagine, if I'm correct, I might be wrong, but I have reasons to believe I'm right, that Franklin Templeton is sitting on an 8 billion US dollar which belongs to the gangsters of Yanukovych gang. They are in Russia. I don't know if Russia really loves them, frankly speaking. But then it turns upside down everything. It means that the democratic uh, government of Obama has really been involved with protecting and giving Krisha and money laundering for Yanukovych regime because Yanukovych never intended to use the money. He's stolen over 40 billion US dollars in the simplest way. Whole Kiev knew that every week, every minister and deputy prime minister and heads of the state corporation would come to Yanukovych's son, a stomatologist, and report how much money he made during the week. And every week, 
the few cars of cash in Hrivnes would come into a specially uh, protected building in, in Kiev. The whole city knew that for years. How come the Americans wouldn't know about that? And I wonder if Paul Manafort has anything to say about the whole scheme. And another big lawyer in Washington who's been money laundering for Yanukovych. And Yanukovych always dreamed of using that money outside Russia. He was most unfortunate to flee. And, but on top of that, it's not the end of the story. Once Yanukovych fled the country, the Americans appointed an American lady to head the Ministry of Finance of, uh, of Ukraine with probably some other purposes, but including restructuring the foreign debt of Ukraine in such a way that Franklin Templeton is not offended. This is unbelievable. If it comes that close to the authorities, then I'm, I, mean, I don't know what to say. But then it turns upside down the whole story of America and Europe helping the Ukrainian people. They've been helping Yanukovych and his gang to steal money from the Ukrainian nation. And unfortunate was Yanukovych, he would flee to Russia with some remains of the cash. Quite a lot of money, but a trifle um, in comparison to what they've stolen. So we've written a letter asking uh, President Trump to pass that message to the Department of Justice. And if they agree to ask two questions to Franklin Templeton, what have they been discussing with this gentleman on an official visit? But of course, this unofficial visit from top officers of the Yanukovych government was supposed to be, uh, to be sanctions in Washington. And secondly, what were the proceeds used for buying the foreign debt of Ukraine to the amount of 50%? And whether that money has been known to be dirty and illegal or not. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you for joining us uh, and for giving a fascinating speech. Um, <laughs> I'll ask a, f a few questions before opening up to the audience. So um, you talk about uh, money laundering. Um, in recent months, Russian wealth in London appears to be departing. Since the poisoning of Sergei Skirpal, uh, Britain's relationship with Russia is deteriorating. Uh, and for instance, the high-profile case of Roman Ab Abramovich, owner of Chelsea, not getting his visa renewed is uh, just an example. What do you think can be done to ameliorate the situation? Do you think it's good that Russian money is leaving oh, and that Britain is tightening its... Um I don't think it's leaving unless the National Crime Agency comes after the money, but then it's too late to leave. No, um, I don't believe any of those fraudsters. Well, the normal Russians with normal money here are really feel very uncomfortable. That's beyond any doubt. I've heard that from them because in fact, they've been going as far as asking whether I can organize a dispute in the British press. There are good Russians and bad Russians. There's, there's no task simpler than that. I can provide for the British government a list of a few hundreds of individuals with proof that they've stolen money and they've nothing to do with being victims of the regime. This is what is being advised to them by the local lawyers. Uh, well, Abramovich, I, he definitely can explain the origin of his wealth. This is Gazprom buying Sibneft. So I don't think it's too fair. But I'll, I'll chokingly, I, I, I could give you my example. I received uh, two weeks ago a copy of the court appeal in London. And it says, there's a British lady with Italian name, that me, my wife, Prince Charles, and two former bosses of MI5 are trying to poison a British lady. This is lunatic. Okay, it's, 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 um, it's just somebody mad. But this means that the little paranoia also is reflected in minds of people. Luckily for me, it's not only me and my wife, it's Prince Charles. <laughs> uh, and, and MFI for my Evans boss. So the court would not <laughs> accept it because it's, it's absurd. But if I were just with my wife, I would have probably to explain that in the British court. Why am I poisoning, poisoning her? hacking her emails and uh, also getting some, some nervous gases to her. <laughs> okay, I think, I think sooner rather than later, the British services would reveal. I can only say that I am 80% sure 
that has come from Russia. But when I'm commenting the Skripal case, I'm, I'm saying we can expect anything from an operation from Russian Siloviki who want to completely mm, exclude the possibility of Putin agreeing with the West. It could be some Ukrainian nationalists, could be anyone except. Stop blaming it either on Putin or on the British Queen, which is what the Russian media is doing. <laughs> this is absurd. But luckily, the, the both of them are alive. And uh, you've heard Putin saying at the direct line, if it were, if it were us, they wouldn't survive. Okay, this is his, his sense of humor. <laughs> but I get, get reason to say that. Uh, I, at the moment, do not see things considerably changing in the British attitude towards the Russian dirty money. I haven't seen any intention of going after that before. I've heard a lot of words. And if my information is right, that the National Crime Agency have started to come and knock on the door of the Russians, that's good. But don't expect Russian money to leave London without serious British effort. Thank you. Um, so at the end of your speech, you mentioned uh, the story of money laundering in Ukraine um, and Paul Manafort's uh, alleged uh, relationship with that. Um, as you are all aware he was Trump's campaign manager for a big part yeah. of the election yeah. uh, and has been indicted on several uh, charges of money laundering. Um, yes. Given the ongoing U.S. investigation on Russian interference uh, and special counsel Robert Mueller um, indicting a lot of Russian oligarchs, to what extent do you think Russian uh, interference actually happened in the U.S. election? And to what extent was it um, made under the direction of the government? Well, I, I, I share Putin's opinion that it would be very strange to assume that Russians can seriously influence such a thing as an American election. But I would separate it into different cases. For example, Vexelberg and Diribaska, I think what they thought is that they somehow assumed that Kremlin loves Trump better than Clinton, which I don't think is such a clear mm, uh, conclusion. I don't know where it comes to them. And both of them have been following their own agenda. First of all, to try to find much more about what's going on in the elections. That's why why Diribasko was paying to Manafort and Vexelberg to coin. And then they thought they would come to Kremlin and uh, say, well, we, we've done it. But this is naive. I think it's strange. I doubt the Kremlin has been instructing them to do that. So they didn't know their own. Uh, regarding Prigozhin using all of the trolls and bots, well, yes, but he was training on me for a year and a half back in Moscow. I was under a very severe bots and trolls uh, attack for a year and a half. And once he finished me, and I have to admit, I gained some immunity to that afterwards. So nothing bad comes without something good about it, as the Russian saying would go. But then he probably went to train in American elections, but probably he influenced it that little. So Putin is probably right when he's saying how low do we have to think about American establishment if they think the restaurateur could influence the American election. Well, this is not a simple restaurateur, I have to admit, but I think his influence was pretty, pretty. Everything else, I see that some of the Trump's officials were hooked on, on promises of Russians coming with dirt on Clinton. That does not materialize. I think, I think that I don't believe that, in general, the conclusion of Mueller could be that Russians, seriously, because you cannot preclude a Russian thinking that he can interfere and influence, where he's doing a stupid job. It's just an illusion, it's just idiotic. So I partially share the Trump's view on the witch hunt, but let's wait and see. I mean, it's, it's going to all be finished fairly soon, in my view. Thank you. Um, so a question about your political career. As you mentioned, you were a member of parliament for four years uh, and you launched a new social democratic party with Gorbachev. Could you tell us about the circumstances of uh, the creation of the party and why you think the party was unsuccessful? It was a known starter. Unfortunately, I'm a friend of Gorbachev and I respect him highly, but he's not respected back in the country. So if you want a value, you marry Gorbachev from a political party, but he wanted to do that. and. I've agreed, frankly. 
Yes. Uh, and I've never been pursuing a political career. This is the wrong assumption uh, of, of the Russian authorities. I've been practicing as an individual, as a citizen, in various. I supported a free newspaper. I ran a few elections. I did two things in the parliament. I prohibited the gambling. I wanted to reduce it very severely, but it was prohibited. So I was having bodyguards for quite some time because I've deprived certain individuals, the gangsters of a few billion US dollars of cash. And then I made plea bargaining. I've introduced into the Russian criminal code plea bargaining on American based on American models. So all of the serious crime which has been uh, which has been people indicted in the recent years was based on my so I didn't waste my time. But in a sense I was practicing. I was I, I wanted trying to get a first hand impression of Russian judicial system. I was suing FSB twice. Of course I lost. I was suing the central bank five times. I was suing every minister, every ministry, I've lost all of that. So I have quite first hand impression about the Russian judicial system. As a member of parliament, when I was there until 2007, there was some independence, there's no anymore, unfortunately. So I'm publicly not uh, refusing to admit that I was very critical of Russian political system for years. I've given hundreds of interviews to CNN, BBC. I was the most serious critic of the system. And I still think we cannot obtain more than 1%, 1.5% of the growth, economic growth, if we don't have an independent parliament, independent judiciary, more free media. But on free media, uh, I'm very disillusioned with the American media because they're biased. They all split into groups on the Trump camp and nobody really follows the truth. I mean, it's very bad. But then I became disillusioned because I did the same in the West. I was suing General Electric in the court of this country and I've lost the appeal. Mm. And then I tried to make some newspapers interested in the story, which they're mostly interested, but they can't because General Electric is paying them a lot. So I became very disillusioned. And the quality of Western politicians nowadays, if you compare them to Putin. So, I mean, I, I've lost ground for criticism. So I decided to stay away a bit, to be neutral and to see. For example, my testing litmus test for the West, whether they really go after whole world's dirty money, because it's time. But I'm not sure it's going to happen. Let's wait and see. So you mentioned you were nearly jailed in 2014 in Moscow. Uh, what happened? Well, I was under investigation by eight senior investigators for something I did in public under 14 cameras with 300 witnesses. And I was uh, expecting my, uh, my sentence, uh, risking five years in prison. Uh, I don't know, something happened. I got 130 years um, hours of community service. The community service, it's a completely new kind of Russian courts normally mm, they have 1.5 percent of uh, acquittals so normally you go to jail <laughs> but somehow I don't know it so happened that I was released from the pressure good knows I could be only guessing uh, but probably there are some reasons uh, but I really became much quieter for a few years. Uh, maybe perhaps, perhaps I've lost most of my business and came off the Forbes list and I'm so happy. I'm just a normal individual. I was always thinking the Forbes list is the stupidest things in the world. People look at you as if you're an idiot. And I've never been using my money for causes others than improving lives of other people. Um, I never bought anything in the south of France. Uh, boats, properties, I don't like it. So the only thing I am a bit frustrated is I can't spend as much as I used to on charities. But even in charities you live and learn. There's so much money I've spent which has been misused. So for example, according to my best of my knowledge, our British newspapers have been the, the, the biggest fundraising in the history of this country. We've raised more than 100 million pounds. And we've recently bought the papers. But if we do something, we follow up, we go to Africa to protect the elephants, we go with 
special forces in charge of that. We really oversee everything though. We're fighting poverty in London. We're helping Gosh Hospital. So we're trying to really follow up so the money reaches its destination. But that's the only thing I am a bit frustrated having left the Forbes list. Thank you. Um, now's a good time to open up to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand uh, mm -hmm. and we, uh, and then you can stand up and ask a question. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Um, obviously, you've had a very interesting career path, so I would like to talk more about your life. Um, I was wondering how, um, how did you get um, recruited to KGB um, straight after uh, university? And um, what business you're involved in right now, except for publishing, perhaps new ideas that you're, um, you're thinking of, such as VIP air airplanes? Um, thank you. Well, it was a normal recruitment. <laughs> I guess it happens here as well. I was approached, I was already married, and I've spoken two languages, I had a kid. I was very anti-Soviet, I have to admit, it's in my book. So I think that most of the dissidents were hiding inside the foreign intelligence in the first chief directorate of KGB, because there are people who've been traveling around the world and they can compare. So probably they thought, oh, this is an honest guy. He reads Solzhenitsyn, he tells political anecdotes, he's more reliable than somebody who does a lot of um, communal Soviet type Komsomol or party jobs. But this is a joke. Uh, so it's nothing special. I was really, uh, I intended to go to the Academy of Science. And originally it happened when Andropov came to power. So Andropov was bumping, he was a clever man apparently. And he get fed up with the Russian academics telling him that the cap cap capitalism would die soon. So it was first stage of dying capitalism, second, third. So Andropov became frustrated because the Soviet Union situation economically have been impaired a lot. Soviet Union was borrowing a lot. Soviet Union was importing a lot of grain. Soviet Union suffered from exchange rate fluctuations and nobody in the country would be able to tell to the bosses, the party bosses, what's happening. Because the Academy of Science were afraid. There was a dogma. On dogma, capitalism should die and the Soviet Union should win, which was the opposite. So Andropov decided to recruit a little bit small department inside the analytical department. This is, so I was uh, interested in writing uh, a doctorate on uh, the Russian participation in the global financial systems. That was, by mere fact, a confidential information. And so they've convinced me that I can do it inside rather than outside with a better access to. So that's the story, it's nothing. I was in the analytical department. So my position was to read, which has been received from all over the world. And in a short way, as my former boss would say, you have to write so the idiots would even understand. Meaning that in half a page, you have to explain a big story about an industry, about, I don't know, global rivalry between European, the Japan and, and uh, Europe and states, etc. So it's nothing, it's, it's just normal standard procedure. It's as, as well as the Soviet foreign intelligence was the same as CIA, probably uh, even more disciplined in the sense that they could never do anything without an order, etc. So, you so I was based here until 92. You'd lived in London uh, for a few yeah. years as a spy. Uh, how was that experience? Interesting. But it was the time when lots of information has been uh, requested by Gorbachev. So I loved it because I thought I was putting some input into changes. And it was, I mean, you would run home to have a view at Russian TV uh, special or read some. It was an interesting time with lots of expectations. And uh, in 92, when I quit, Yeltsin thought that automatically foreign intelligence is part of KGB, which is complete nonsense. It's just absurdity. It was a completely special, separate institution. It's just the Stalin centralization that put everything inside one roof. So I left and went into business with, uh, I was a, a lieutenant colonel, I was 32. I had 500 pounds in my pocket. 
<laughs> and I didn't understand anything about what business was because I've met all of the uh, future oligarchs stationed in London. So I came back home, I thought, oh, it's easiest thing is to make a billion, which was completely wrong. And I was for a few years doing everything and failing on everything. We once imported ladies' shoes. It all came from South Korea, only for one foot left. <laughs> and the number was 32. <coughs> so we've been cheated everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's quite a funny times. But by 2000, by 96, I've uh, bought a little bank because what I've learned in London, I used uh, secondary foreign countries debt trading. So I convinced one of the banks, they made a lot of money. They decided to go along without me and failed because the Brady bonds were going up and down. You have to really understand the, what it was. So I bought a little bank and uh, in, a, in a few years became one of the biggest banks in, in Russia. There's no party gold with Gorbachev, unfortunately, which is what Prigozhin's trolls were writing about me. Lebedev has stolen the party gold. There was no party gold, unfortunately. Look at Gorbachev, he's penniless. He doesn't have anything. So um, it, when you founded the bank um, in 1998, I believe there was a big... Uh, 96. 96. And uh, there was a, a big financial crisis, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, out of the 10 main banks, only yours and one other survived. <coughs> what do you think was, uh, was the success, uh, the reason for the success of your bank? Well, I've lost everything. By uh, September, August 98, I've made about a billion US dollar on stocks and bonds and secondary debt trading. By the end of the year, I've lost everything. Everything. But we negotiated with most of the other foreign banks we've negotiated and we decided instead of stripping the assets, pocketing them, and leaving the bank bankrupt and blaming it all on the crisis. We decided we're an alpha out of two big banks we, we went through. And then we've been through, through two more crises, but the most important for me was the attack, an artificial attack. Because the idea was that if I need to give money to the depositors, if they are scared, they're gonna rush to pick up the money and you have to pay them within two weeks time. Where are the loans, what can you do with the loans? You either sell them at huge discounts, which I did. I actually brought back all of my dividends from the bank, 200 million. I've sold all the properties, everything, and I paid out, but with a big loss. Because if I would be selling the assets in the normal way, I could have, but I've paid out a billion US dollars. That was everything I built over 15 years. But I'm sort of a proud because I don't have, the bank now is 20 times smaller and I won't allow it to take any banking risks. I have no liabilities, I only have the capital. So I employ 100 people and keep the bank for reputational purposes. Claiming that I'm the only banker in the country who can say that if you don't steal, you can always pay back to the clients. If you steal, okay. So for, for the second part of, uh, we'll go for a second question over there, yeah. What can be done to improve relationship between uh, Russia and England? <laughs> the best way is the British crown goes over the dirty money and then the Russia becomes interested and they start talking, who's gonna confiscate that money? So it's a good basis for cooperation. <laughs> um, Skripal case has to be investigated. So I hope we, it will happen because it's really, is a big irritation because I can see Putin that he's quite frustrated. Um, and but it's normal diplomats and politicians work. It's just standard thing which happened many times in history. Um, for example, the football championship is a good thing. Well, I was reading Independent this morning. The Independent travel correspondent has covered all of the major cities uh, who are um, accepting the, uh, the World Cup. And he, ends, he starts from St. Petersburg, goes through Moscow, Sochi, Krasnodar, Kaliningrad, and comes to Saransk, which is the capital of, of Mordovia, and says, come there, see the match, and immediately leave. This is the ugliest city in the world. There's so many funny comments about my son, about me. 
Uh, they even them, some educated people have picked up the Evelyn Vaux scoop. You remember uh, about the journalist who sits in Addis Ababa, drinks heavily, and writes as if he is in the front. So we are wondering whether our correspondent ever visited Saransk. But without independent writing about Saransk, who would ever know about Saransk in the world? So it's <laughs> I mean, just normal work. And by the way, the very important thing is to bring down the cultural barriers. Because there's so little understanding between the two countries. There has to be more understanding. And this is, this is a task of the journalism. But I'm afraid the journalists are more scarce than the cosmonauts. There's been over 600 cosmonauts in space. I'm afraid there are less good journalists. And uh, equal. In UK, in the United States, in, in, in Britain, uh, it's, it's a difficult profession, which even affects your mentality. The more talented is a journalist, the more misanthropic he is normally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question will go to the gentleman just over there. Yeah, it's you. And the glasses. Um, thanks a lot for your talk. I was just wondering, Putin was just um, re-elected for, I think, six years. Yeah. Um, what do you think is going to be the future in terms of political leadership? Will it be Putin forever? Will there be someone from within the party, within his inner circle? Will there be someone completely new? What is your current take on the situation? Thank you. There's plenty of choices for Putin, but I won't speculate. Uh, he definitely intends to stay for a long time. Uh, I've heard Deribaska was actually for years working on, on a tablet to make people immortal. If he succeeds, uh, who knows? <laughs> he was confusing Kremlin <laughs> with that for a long time. Um, well, Putin is full of, full of spirit, in excellent physical form. He enjoys it. I have to admit he did a good job in Syria. Somebody has to stand up against ISIS. And uh, he's very clever in world politics. And, and finally, I, I'm, 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 I was criticizing Kremlin for many years. But then I suddenly thought, oh, if Putin is loved by Russian people, who am I to dispute that? So in a sense, I'm, uh, I can criticize Putin if you want now. But the point about Stalipin, the famous Russian prime minister killed in 1912, who said, give me 20 years of stability and, uh, um, and I will change everything. There are certain signs of, uh, for example, Russian agriculture has been doing just exceptionally well. We have outtaken the United States as a main exporter of grain. And some other industries, in general, of course, the rate of growth is too low because you have to change the political system. But who knows who's in, in, in Putin's mind? I would not be critical of him staying in power. He stayed less than Merkel. Uh, so I'd rather give him a chance of another six years. And then I would expect he would either find a successor in a handman way or become the prime minister again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question will go to gentleman. Thank you so much. Uh, two weeks ago, Mike Markfall gave a speech here. He presented his book. And if I remember correctly, he mentioned that Russia had a chance in 1991 or 1992 to start the path towards democracy and the chance was missed. Do you feel that Russia had any, ever any chance in the recent history to become a democratic country? I have no doubt. But by the way, I would rather blame the American advisors for the lost opportunities in the beginning of 90s. They've been really giving idiotic advice and the liberals in charge were um, um, were really doing lots of wrong things. For example, the scheme loan for shares is completely unfair. I would not doubt it's legal, but it's just passing the, the whole national wealth into the hands of 10 individuals. It's just completely ridiculous. By the way, 
Uh, my next step is that we will question. Putin in 2012 said during the election campaign that he wouldn't mind looking into copying the uh, Labour government windfall tax. You will remember that. So he was thought he thought he was ready to tax the oligarchs who participated in all for shares auctions. It's interesting whether he puts his money where the mouth is. Um, but yes, definitely Russia has a chance. It all at the moment it all depends on him. He can definitely make the parliament more independent, at least to have, I don't know, 10% of the deputies who would be serving the interest of other parts of people in the country. He definitely can improve the judiciary. On the mass media, I think since the America, as I said, has become really biased, the media is very biased, they all split into two camps, Fox pro Trump, I don't know, CNN anti-Trump, and they're really not honest anymore. And from that point of view, there's enough free mass media in Russia, thanks to him, because he could have closed Nova Gazette to be on any doubt. He probably thinks that he would look very favorably if he doesn't, which is good. Uh, unfortunately, the readership for the liberal press is pretty tiny. It's a few million people for a country of 146 million. Uh, but as I said, I am now equally treating both political systems. I've lost my trust in the Western political system. It's a judicial system and the freedom of press. So I don't see any difference. Even on balance, on this dirty money thing, it's stolen here and parked and laundered here. The both sides are participating in it. The only topic which I've been covering in my book, that the West should ask everybody coming, every foreigner, bureaucrat, businessman, its niece, its mistress, its stepdaughter, anybody, somebody fronting for them to declare their origins of their wealth. This is a simple step. At least do that. If you don't, I won't trust you. And as I said, why not pass this uh, topic to G7? Thank you. At least they will have some agenda of a serious nature. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one final question. Um, so for the final question, we'll go to the gentleman over there. And uh, it was interesting to hear about media, role of media as well. I just wondered, you run two newspapers, you own. So what do you see the role of media? Is it playing, what kind of role the media is playing in this US, or sorry, the Russian relationship? Or is it portraying the right kind of perception? Or how do you see the role of media in future? Is it independent? Well, one has to separate because Britain still has a lot of media. There's a competition. Uh, I even read Daily Mail from time to time because it's a talented newspaper. I don't necessarily share its views, but, but I, I enjoy reading it. Where in Russia, at weekend, there's nothing to read at all. Nothing. Just won't believe it. And during the normal day of the weekend, I cover all of the newspapers in 15 minutes. That's why we think that independent would be a good thing to translate into Russian. Because there's already quite a substantial readership. By the way, we've opened in India uh, independent recently. The States, as I said, uh, unfortunately, because of Trump, there was a divide in the local media. And uh, all of them lost the ability of being unbiased, unfortunately. Really. The CNN are ridiculing Trump and Fox is just, we love Trump. Um, and it's, it doesn't work this way. As I said, the problem of journalism is this is not enough of investigative reporting. But I have a problem. I've been never interfering in the information policy of, of, uh, uh, of, of newspapers of which I was a proprietor. Uh, I don't even know the journalist intentionally, so I couldn't be accused. In Russia, the authorities has always been suspicious. They thought, I am telling the journalist to do that. In fact, I was only funding the newspaper and would you imagine me telling anything to say Anna Politkovskaya or Marie Dzhevsky? Uh, I, I was accused originally when we bought Independent that I'm influencing Dzhevsky because she writes very good things about Putin. She's very clever. She's very knowledgeable about Russia. And the funny thing that was a complaint to the regulator, uh, like a few years ago, she would 
Twitter. Who is Lebedev? I've never seen him. Ha, I would like to see him when he's he going to be influencing me. <laughs> that was funny, really. I've never seen her in my life. But there's definitely a big role for the media to play, uh, especially in the topic I've been covering and on lots of other topics. Um, it's a pity. I, I rather understand the Brits for the Brexit, but I'm on the other side. But definitely Sun and Mail did a good job about it. So there's a lot of influence the British media possesses, uh, but some other countries much less. And some other countries, the media does not exist at all. So this, uh, the, the British journalism tradition is uh, very old. And uh, even for Russians, uh, it's uh, so talented, the journalism here is, that even for a Russian, most of the things written in British press are pretty interesting because they cover everything from local politics to, I don't know, big international issues, healthcare, education, pretty interesting, really. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today, but please join me in thanking uh, Alexander Lebedev for joining us today.